Superbug apocalypse and antibiotic resistance, those are big scary words, but how bad is it really? Well, according to the World Health Organization, antibiotic resistance is one of the greatest threats that we have to global health. Every 15 minutes, someone dies in the United States because of a superbug that we basically created. That's 35,000 people a year, and around the world, over 700,000 people die every year now from superbugs. And that's not even the worst part, even though that's a large number. What's even worse is what's about to happen. And the World Health Organization estimates that we will have 10 million deaths a year from superbugs unless we drastically change the way that we use antibiotics. In this video, you will learn what an antibiotic really is, how it actually works, and when it does more harm than good. That way, you can know enough to be part of the solution rather than the problem when it comes to superbugs. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. What if I told you that medical doctors around the world are breeding superbugs in the general population, in people like you and me, and the people are not informed that they're part of that experiment? That sounds crazy, right? That sounds like the biggest conspiracy theory you ever heard. And yet, unfortunately, that's pretty much exactly what's going on. It's not happening because people are evil. It's because they are ignorant. They are uninformed. They don't realize what's happening and the seriousness of what they're participating in. And this should be of concern to all of us because this cuts across men and women, all ages, all countries, and it's a growing problem. So let's just start off with some of the basics. What is an antibiotic? What, what does antibiotic mean? Well, the word itself means against life, all right? It's a substance that kills something. And the good thing about antibiotics is that they kill bacteria without killing the body cells. So it's selective in that sense. Okay, that's why they were so revolutionary. That's why it is a miracle drug. But once we understand that they are against life, that they kill something, we also have to realize that they can be very destructive. And especially when they're overused, they are very destructive. So the thing that they kill, even though they spare human cells, they also kill off the bacteria in your gut your microbiome. And since you can only be as healthy as your microbiome, every time that you take an antibiotic, you are upsetting the balance. You're killing off certain strains and you're allowing other strains to proliferate. And then if you eat a lot of sugar and processed foods, now you're gonna give all of those non-wanted, unwanted bacteria a virtual buffet. So you're further upsetting that balance. So because antibiotics kill things, even though they spare human cells, they do kill off both wanted and unwanted bacteria in your body. So in your gut, you have something called your microbiome, the flora of all the life forms and bacteria that live in your gut. And you can only be as healthy as your gut bacteria. When they are unhealthy, you're unhealthy. When they're out of balance, you're out of balance. So an antibiotic, it doesn't discriminate much. It pretty much just kills off a lot or most of the bacteria in your gut. And then depending on what you eat afterwards, you might replenish the bacteria that you want or the ones that you don't want. And if you eat a lot of sugar and processed food and grain, then you're gonna selectively feed the pathogenic bacteria. You're gonna feed the ones you don't want and they're gonna start taking over. And then if you repeat this antibiotics course, which happens to a lot of people, now you're getting your bacterial flora more and more out of whack. 
The second reason not to use antibiotics unless you have to is that it decreases your immunity. How does it do that? Well, the way that you build immunity is by being exposed to pathogens and then your immune system goes to work to identify and develop a defense against those pathogens. So the more varied pathogens you're exposed to and the more that you successfully develop your own defense against them, the stronger your immune system is, the more capable it is. But if every time you get an infection, you take an antibiotic, then you're not allowing your body the chance to develop that immunity. So you're hampering your immune system. Babies are born pretty much without an immune system. That's why the mother's milk contain immunoglobulins to help the baby fight off disease. But if you keep giving the baby antibiotics, everything, they get a little sniffle, it never gets a chance to develop a proper immunity. The next thing we need to understand is how antibiotics work. When do they work and when do they not work? So the mechanism by which an antibiotic works is that it destroys cell walls and it interferes with metabolism. And in a bacterium, a bacterium has a cell wall. This would be a bacterium and very often they have a little tail so they can move around. And inside they have a metabolic machinery that's very similar to what your inside of cells look like. They can make proteins, they can create energy out of sugar and so forth. So a bacterium is alive and the antibiotic works because it's against life. It can destroy the cell wall so the bacterium starts leaking and it can interfere with the life-sustaining processes and the duplication of that bacterium. However, a virus is not like a bacterium. A virus doesn't have a cell wall. A virus doesn't have metabolism. A virus is technically not alive, so you can't kill it. All right? So an antibiotic being against life has no impact on a virus. A virus is more like a crystal. It can't generate energy on its own. It uses the energy of the host cell. A virus is pretty much just a cluster of genetic material and a few more parts. And it uses the energy, it uses the resources of the cell it's infecting to duplicate that material. But it never was alive, so you can't really kill it. That's why antibiotics have no effect and they are never ever recommended for a virus. The only time they are recommended is for a bacterium. So antibiotics don't work for viruses and they destroy your microbiome, your gut flora. So you don't want to take them unless it's absolutely necessary. But how does that lead to superbugs? Well, bacteria just like humans are constantly evolving. They're constantly adapting. There's certain mutations, there's certain traits that get strengthened and bacteria are no exception. So if you have an area, a tissue that has been infected by bacteria, there's going to be different kinds of bacteria. There's going to be a variation in the strains of those bacteria. So let's say that there be a certain number of blue ones and a certain number of red ones. And they're kind of the same, but they're slight variations. And the red ones are a little bit more resistant. They're a little bit stronger. And then you give this person an antibiotic. And the antibiotic goes to work to kill off bacteria. And which one is it going to kill first? The strong ones or the weak ones, right? It's going to kill off the weak ones first. And the ones that have the most resistance, the ones that have adapted, the ones that have changed a little bit, so they're not as affected by the antibiotic, they're going to survive. And now what we have done is we've given them a competitive advantage. Whatever fuel and resources are available in this tissue, there is no competition. It's a buffet. It's a smorgasbord. It's free for all. And now we have selectively bred a stronger bacterium that's more resistant. 
And then eventually, if we do this over and over and over and over, then these bugs are going to develop into super bugs because every time that we step in and kill off the weak ones, the stronger get a competitive advantage. So when should you use an antibiotic? Well, if it is indeed a bacterial infection, you may or may not need an antibiotic. If your body can fight it off on its own, you're better off without the antibiotic because you're not destroying your biome and you're strengthening your immunity. But there are times when the body is so stressed, when the body is so challenged, when your immune system is so beaten down and when the bug is so strong that you want to use an antibiotic. So for serious bacterial infections, they can be life-saving. And one of the primary examples, there may be others, but this is the one they always point out in school, is bacterial encephalitis, basically brain inflammation. And this one could be viral or it could be bacterial. Now, if it is bacterial, it, an antibiotic will help. And if it is bacterial and you don't treat it, if you don't get the antibiotic, it's over 70% fatal. These people die in a couple of days and the antibiotic will save their life. If it's untreated, 70% die and the ones who survive pretty much across the board will have severe neurological damage. So it's almost 100% of people that get their life destroyed and an antibiotic can help. So this is where we want to use it. And that's why it's so critical that we don't use it when we don't have to. So that we don't develop the superbugs and that we have the, the miracle drug when appropriate. So the only other time that it's appropriate, besides when it's life-threatening, is when it looks like it could be life-threatening. If something is looking so bad and it's getting worse, quickly then you may not want to take the time and wait to see to verify that it is bacterial and that would be a time when it'd be still appropriate even though you don't know for sure and so if it looks like or it could be fatal or life-threatening then obviously that could be appropriate and that would be a decision that the doctor would make at the time so this is a huge problem. It has been growing for decades and all the government agencies and the World Health Organization, they know that this is a big deal. So they've issued some guidelines and here are the guidelines from the CDC. And they say a common cold is the third most frequent diagnosis in adults. It's by far the most common respiratory infection and it's the cause for the common cold that most adults experience about two to four times per year. And in no circumstance is an antibiotic recommended for a viral infection. So next condition is called acute rhinosinusitis. Rhino means no, sinuses are sinuses, so it's like a head cold basically. And this is when you have pressure and stuffiness and stuff oozing and it happens to about 12% of people every year. So it's like the common cold is 40 times more common than the diagnosis of acute rhinosinusitis. And then they go on to saying that up to 98% of this condition is viral. Again, antibiotics don't work for viruses. And then they say that it may not even help for a bacterial infection. Even if it's bacterial, antibiotics may still not help. All right? So the management, the recommendations are that if they have established a bacterial infection, then they say watch and wait unless it is a complicated case. So in the small percentage that is actually bacterial, they still recommend that you wait. So that's for the head cold. Now, if it moves down into the chest, then the most common thing is called acute uncomplicated bronchitis. And again, they establish that 95% of this is viral, according to the American Association of Family Physicians. The recommended treatment, routine treatment of uncomplicated acute bronchitis with antibiotics is not recommended regardless 
of how long you have had it. Next is pharyngitis. This is when you lose your voice because of an infection and this is caused by something called GAS, Group A beta hemolytic streptococcal bacteria. And this is the only time where it's usually appropriate with an antibiotic. But they go on to saying only 5 to 10 percent of these cases of adult sore throat are caused by this GAS. So they say it is not recommended to give antibiotics unless you run a test first to establish that it's probably bacterial at least. So the guidelines are pretty clear that the only time it's appropriate is with a serious bacterial infection. Now how well is that working? They set out to do a study where they looked at the prescriptions and the diagnoses and what the procedure was. Dr. Jeffrey Linder of Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago led a team that looked at a total of 510,000 prescriptions from 514 clinics over a period of two years. And it turned out that 54% of the time they had a diagnosis of an infection. He didn't specify if it was bacterial or viral, but half the time they had an infection and the other half they didn't. So 46% of the time there was no diagnosis, no indication of anything infectious going on and yet they were given an antibiotic prescription. In 29% of the cases they had a diagnosis of something else like headache or high blood pressure. In 17% of the cases there was no diagnosis at all. So when we look back about what we just talked about from the CDC that about 85 to 90 percent of infections are viral and then we realize that half the time they don't even make a diagnosis then we can safely assume that the red little sliver here is when it may be appropriate to prescribe an antibiotic and the rest of the time it was inappropriate and this is out of 270 million prescriptions in the United States. So it's almost one per person per year. Now with well-educated and caring doctors, how did we get to this point? Well, first of all, before 19, early 1900s, there were no miracle drugs. And when they discovered penicillin and antibiotics, it was a miracle. It saved a bunch of people that had previously died. So of course everyone was excited and they started using it for everything. But then we also have to understand that medical doctors are just people. They have a few more years of education but they still have bills to pay and they still want to be nice to people. So when someone comes in and says I'm coughing, I'd like a prescription, give me something for this. And then we train the patient that they're supposed to get something now next time if the patient comes and they don't get something they think the doctor's not doing his job and then they're going to go down the street to someone who will do the job properly and prescribe that prescription so we've been trained to expect a prescription when we go to the doctor so it becomes more and more difficult for doctors to deny that they have to spend a lot of time to explain they have to know how big the problem is and they have to be willing to take the time to explain to the patient why it's not a good idea to get an antibiotic. Another big problem is that the majority of antibiotics actually go in animal feed and it doesn't matter if the bacteria mutate and get the competitive advantage in a human or in an animal. They still kind of get out into the environment and when we look at animal feed, more and more products that I see, they say, they state on the package that absolutely no antibiotics or hormones were used in the feeding of these animals, in the production of, of this food. And more and more people are sort of getting their eyes open and realizing that, hey, I don't want that stuff. And yet, the sales of antibiotics go up. The sales of antibiotics 
for animal feed. Between 2009 and 2014, it went up 25% and at the same time more and more products are saying that they don't use it. I don't want to point fingers here, but I think there's something a little fishy going on. So now what? What do we do about this? How can we be part of the solution and stop being part of the problem? Well, first of all, just say no. Understand when it might be appropriate and if it's not appropriate, just don't take it. Use it only if necessary. And that's a big if. Because to me, now this isn't going to hold true for everyone, but based on my experience in my life, I have only once in my life taken an antibiotic. And it was a really bad idea because I had no idea why I was taking it at the time. This was back in college when I was training for the Olympics and I had some foot pain. And they said, well, we don't know what it is. Let's try an antibiotic. And because I had never been exposed to antibiotics growing up in Sweden, I had never ever hardly heard of them. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was something I was supposed to say no to or if it could be a bad thing. So I took it. And of course, it didn't help the foot, but I didn't know any better. And then that was 35 years ago. And I'm doing pretty well without antibiotics. I'm not saying there will never be a time. I'm not saying I'm not open to taking it if it's necessary, but I'm not going to take one just for convenience. If it's the difference between being sick for not taking it and being sick for another week, I'll be sick for another week because then I'll still have my gut flora intact and I will have strengthened my immunity a little bit. Okay, so if it is life threatening, if it's serious, if it could do some serious damage, then of course you want to take it. The next thing is that if for some reason, for whatever reason you start it, Let's say that you watch this video and you just started on antibiotics and then you hear this and you say, oh, I don't want to take those, I'll stop. Don't do that. Okay? If you have started the course, finish the course because if you, take, if you go halfway through, now you're going to kill off some of these bugs and you're going to give a competitive advantage, not just to the strongest, but to some of the ones that you haven't killed off completely. So now you run the risk of getting sick again and making more superbugs. So if you started it, then you want to finish the course. So I encourage you to learn enough. Learn enough about antibiotics, learn enough about health so that you can be a resource for yourself and for others. Tell others how this works and that way you can be an active part in the solution and we can stop this from happening. If you enjoyed this video, I am sure you're going to love that one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.